I want to talk about this uh, pleasant, warm cup of coffee of a movie that you have here. So your character, Ethan, is just a straight up good dude. Like he's thoughtful, he's considerate, he takes the time to make sure he's doing the right thing. And while he doesn't come without his complexities, I feel like his story presents a great view of love, like in both a partner and to a child. And so I, how do you feel that he has shifted your perception of love like even the love that your parents have for you in your overall approach to life each day since doing the film yeah i think i think you're right i think one um the fact that you call him a good dude right he he makes all types of mistakes right throughout yeah. the film and and I think a lot of people think, and I think Ethan would equate those mistakes to like moral morals, right? Like mm -hmm. you make those mistakes, you're a bad person, right? <laughs> or, or, um, and and I, I like to say he's a Libra, right? He, he he seems like a Libra. He goes to people please too much, right? Like in yeah. compromising his own health in the process. It's okay to compromise when everybody's healthy and everybody gets, <laughs> you know, what they need. Um, but when you're not factoring in your own health and your own happiness, your own uh, wellness and pleasure, um, you run into really unhealthy situations. And I think that uh, people think that that people pleasing thing is morally better. <laughs> you know, that you're morally better if you're compromising your health for everybody else, but you don't realize that if you're not being authentic and, and honest, um, in those relationships about what you need that you are contributing to an unhealthy relationship if you aren't healthy too then the relationship is not healthy right um, and so that was one thing that I was I was really dialed in on like in um, interpreting and assessing the character and then the other thing is like you said with with his daughter right that one you could be a great father and um, need to work on your relationship skills, <laughs> but also, um, I loved, I saw glimpses of me and my mom and how we would have, people would be like, why are you talking to your mom? Like an adult, I couldn't call her by her first name. I get popped, but, um, you know, I wasn't disrespectful. Um, but I, I definitely would talk to her like, yeah, you know, and I was considering this thing. I did a tea chart. What do you think? And people are like, why are you, why do y'all sound like two adults talking? And it made me think a lot differently about how I, the relationships, how I treat kids and, mm -hmm. and, and allow them to be their adult selves, you know, and allow them to feel and under, and say what they, they, they feel. And I just really admired their relationship. I admired like sometimes he, when, when she checks him, right? When she checks him, he, he makes sure that he's the adult, but at the same time, lets her know that she's right. Sure. You know, and I'm wrong. Okay, you know what? <laughs> I got to think about that, right? I got to, maybe I should rethink that. Thank you for reminding me, that type of thing. Whereas, you know, you're taught so much that kids should stay in a kid's place, even when they're right. You're from Texas, right? H-Town, Houston, Texas, Mo City. Yes. So uh, I'm from, I'm from Dallas. I hey. I, I know you were born into an arts oriented family, but how do you feel that the Texas art scene may have shaped your love for the arts and creative mind overall? Yeah, I was I was brought up in an artistic family. Everybody had something, music mostly. Um, everybody played an instrument or sang or something, except for my Uncle Ron. He's got like a three note range and doesn't know when to use those notes. but. The other, the other ones, like we were forced into choir and I had to play a recorder, guitar lessons, piano, and I love it. I love music, but it wasn't really, my, that was my family's thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I got into a school play that didn't, didn't have music in it. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is a thing? And people get paid to do this? Um, and I found it and it was my own thing. I found a, a class, um, Kim Terry studio. I found a class outside of, 
um, school because obviously they weren't teaching film and television acting in Houston um, in, in regular schools and public schools. So I had to go on the weekends and I would spend the whole, all Saturday in those spaces. And then I think a lot of people don't realize that Houston's fine arts scene and performing arts scene is thriving. Like it's the Alley Theater has put so many actors on especially black actors, the ballet. Um, I think we had the first black prima donna. There's like so much, prima donna ballerina? Yeah, uh, I'm like, is that ballet? Um, the opera there, the the museums, like the, the art scene in Houston is incredible. Um, I had a lot of inspiration from that. I, w I think I went and saw Rent when I was like mm. 11, something like that um, at the Alley Theater. So there's, um, plenty of inspiration to draw from and people that are super creative in our schools. And then I had theater competitions. I was in theater competitions in high school um, and seeing some <laughs> go into those theater competitions was really inspirational because you see people from all over the country, but definitely from all, all over Texas at the, most local, at the more local tournaments, taking really creative, um, creative, interpretations of the rules because you have so many parameters and it's actually really cool because you have to work with those within those parameters like you can't move a certain distance you have to um, make the characters super distinct from each other but play all of them in humorous interp um, so you know I, I think a lot of people don't don't realize that you know even actually I would even say when I was growing up independent filmmaking was centered in Austin, right? Like mm -hmm. Austin yeah. was like the Mecca for independent filmmaking. And I wanted nothing more to do than to do what Robert Rodriguez was doing down there and building a little studio for himself and like filming things that he loved. Um, I can talk all day about the the art scene yeah. and the film scene in Houston, I mean, in, in Texas. Um, there was a lot of inspiration, you know, and I, I think it's very undervalued. People don't think of Texas that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to share that with me. I, I always am very passionate about it. So anytime I get a chance to talk to a fellow Texan about it, it's all yep. right with me. So uh, I know we're just about out of time, so I'll cut you loose on this. I, I'm a sucker for walking and talking scenes in romance films. And there's a great one between Ethan and Rachel that brings up quite a, quite a few questions that I could probably spend a great deal of your time going through. But uh, the one that I particularly was drawn to is when they talk about their past failures, like Rachel talks about her first restaurant, Ethan talks about his, his book. And I like it because it comes full circle later in the film when someone says, I, I don't think more about the mess than the outcome. And if I may ask, what is maybe the past failure that you're most thankful for in your life that you think most contributed to who you are and the choices that you make? Well, <laughs> uh, I've made a lot of them, but I would say a lot of people told me not to start an organization with my own money. Uh, and um, I don't ever regret paying people to do good work. Yeah. Um, and I understand why they say that <laughs> now and starting a company with your own money. I totally understand it and I get the rules of investment. Um, but, you know, we were so driven by passion that I don't regret for one second ever paying people to do good work. Yeah. Um, and I would say the other one is probably a bigger one, which is that when I first came to LA in 2007 or whatever, I was like, I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna be bi-coastal. I'm gonna book a, a television show or a movie and be and become a big star and become bi-coastal and um, fly back and forth within five, six months. I was like, I got this, don't worry. I've already saved up my money. When I tell you that money went so quick, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, a month in, I had not established my residency like I said I was. I was going to go to UCLA, still didn't go to UCLA. I have not gone to college. I have not spent one day in college. <laughs> but I had plans, okay? I had plans. Um, 
and I was swiftly reminded <laughs> that the world doesn't work according to your plans. Um, I I am grateful for being humbled in that. <laughs> you know, I lost, I literally lost. I said, I'm not going to move to LA without a place to stay, a car, a job. And I lost, and an agent. And I lost all of those things within a month. And especially in looking at it now, I still have those same desires. I still have the desires to connect um, my Houston and Texas folks to Hollywood and give better opportunities and access to high quality filmmaking um, and art. And I still want to inspire them with the opportunities um, and bring more opportunities to Houston. And that's what, what is incredible to me and warms my heart is I still want the same things, even if I'm, as I'm looking at our company and build power and, and what was and how we've built it. It might have taken much longer than I thought it was going to take, but I was still dedicated to that purpose. And, mm -hmm. and it warms me up every time I'm like consistent with that, where I'm like, you know what? I still want what I want and I'm still going to work really hard for it. And I've learned how to build it from the ground up, including my own morals and values and how to systemize that and how to build community effectively. And if I, if I had just got, came to LA, with you know so much privilege that I didn't have to worry about that um, and I didn't have to understand how to completely rebuild my life not knowing people in LA and understand the business deeper and how to create projects and get into producing um, workshops and such and, and building laterally with people I would still have the mentality of like you have to reach up to get something. You have to placate to elite people and like do all of these things that um, were, you know, for lack of a better term, fake facades mm -hmm. that we were taught growing up that it's lonely at the top, that you have to shed your community in order to get there. You have to step on people and, you know, be ruthless or whatever. Um, I got grounded in South LA and you know with black folks with you know good values that had um that had very similar purposes and um uh motivation to to change the world and they they instilled that in me